Thank you. It's nice, I haven't even said anything. Um, I can go now, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to present a little bit of my theoretical and empirical work that I conducted and I'm still conducting in my PhD down under. Um, the, this talk may seem a little bit disjointed because in a sense I've got two uh, fairly distinct streams in my PhD. One is to do with looking at uh, cognitive therapies for depression and the other is looking into um, antidepressant mechanisms of non-ordinary states. Um, given the rather conservative politics in Australia, we're still a ways away from doing anything other than mindfulness or hypnosis. Um, so. Uh, a part of my PhD involved quite a theoretical component looking at um, uh, a lot of the literature to date and formulating some basic ideas around it. So no doubt many of you know the problem of depression. It affects more than 300 million people today. Um, it will soon be the number one disease burden on the planet. Um, and yet only about half of all psychotherapies and pharmacotherapies uh, seem to work. And they don't work that well because most people who respond to these psychotherapies and pharmacotherapies still experience sub-diagnostic symptoms. And when they stop whatever treatment they're on, a quarter of them relapse within a year, half within two, and 80% eventually. So it's an enormously um, widespread problem and it's, in, it's, it's difficult to, to treat. And so in this context, um, new theoretical frameworks and new empirical uh, avenues are, are sorely needed. There's one very obvious and striking fact that pops out of the non-ordinary states literature, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this, that a very wide range of non-ordinary states have antidepressant value. And this is remarkable because these non-ordinary states are quite different to one another. So there's research showing that various forms of meditation, Vipassana mindfulness, uh, transcendental and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy have antidepressant value. Various psychedelics have antidepressant value. Uh, hypnosis um, is an antidepressant. And there are numerous other non-ordinary states that have antidepressant value. And so given the heterogeneity of these non-ordinary states, this simple fact um, begs the question, what do they have in common um, that might be contributing to their antidepressant value? So that's one of the things I'm interested in. And so when you look at um, the things that non-ordinary states have in common and you compare them to depression, you notice that there are numerous antitheticals, numerous ways in which these um, can be dissociated quite distinctly. One way is that non-ordinary states seem to be linked to decreased default mode network activation in the brain and a decrease, a concurrent decrease in basic default thinking. I'll explain that in a bit more detail. While depression shows the opposite pattern. And so one of the things I want to propose is this basic hypothetical continuum where you have default processes that occur spontaneously and in non-ordinary states these seem to be reduced and in depression these seem to be enhanced. So the default mode network is this you know popular sexy network in the brain everybody likes these days. Uh, it involves mostly medial structures uh, like the medial prefrontal cortex uh, cingulate structures as well as some lateral structures like the precuneus and this this network uh, was discovered like a lot of things in science a little bit by accident when uh, um, researchers noticed there were commonalities in brain activation across participants in a scan in, in, in fMRI scanners when they were not doing anything when they were just simply lying in there waiting for their next instruction and this was across many, many different trials across many different laboratories and 
about 15 years ago, there was this kind of surge in interest in what this spontaneous activity in the brain might be. So default mode network seems to um, represent uh, task negative activation or activation that occurs spontaneously in the brain. It's a resting state of the brain and it's uh, uh, phenomenologically associated with mind wandering. It's anti-correlated or um, you know, when it goes up, uh, what goes down are frontal parietal regions that are, that are involved in sensory perception, uh, in motor commands, and in basic cognitive control, the ability to focus your attention in a particular way. So if you think about those functions, default mind wandering or resting state activity uh, is in many ways antithetical to that. And, you know, it's, it, it's perceptually decoupled, that is, when default mode network is highly activated, we are less responsive to our sensory perceptual environment. And this can be shown behaviorally as well as neurologically. What is the default network actually representing? It, 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 uh, the frontal parts of it represent self-reference, so the ways in which um, information might reference you or just simply thinking about yourself. So whether you think about yourself or think about some uh, external um, source of information in reference to you, the default mode network goes up. It's involved in social cognition, so thinking about other people and thinking about what is in the minds and, uh, of other people and their intentions, mentalizing and theory of mind. It's involved in thinking about the future, prospecting, and relevant to the empirical study I'm going to show you, it's also involved in understanding and producing story, which um, I'll argue briefly is, is the way in which we make sense of reality. So depression has been associated consistently and repeatedly to broad increases in activity in the default mode network and also uh, increases in functional connectivity between parts of the default mode network. So basically, uh, depression is associated with uh, a default mode network that is more active and more uh, wired up to itself. In contrast, psilocybin has been associated with decreased integration within the default mode network and an increased synchrony uh, with the default mode network and task positive networks. That is, typically what happens is when the default mode network lights up, task positive networks <coughs> go down. So we're either in our own internal state, mind wandering, or we're somehow goal oriented and, uh, and doing a task. And in psilocybin, it seems like that distinction is broken down more, where we can be internal and then uh, somehow task oriented as well, somehow externally driven as well. And these little pretty pictures just show you um, an increase in psilocybin of connectivity between parts of the default mode network and other regions that are task positive regions. So a simple example, mind wandering, which is one of the features of default mode network activation. Um, mind wandering engages the default mode network it's linked to depression. Uh, there's this idea, although it's not as simple as it was first reported in the Killingsworth uh, article, but the idea is that mind wandering leads to uh, unhappiness. Uh, as it turns out, it's more mind wandering about the future that leads to unhappiness. Uh, negative mood induction increases your mind wandering. So if you're made to feel unhappy, then you mind wander more. Um, and if you practice mindfulness meditation, uh, your default mode network activity goes down, as does your mind wandering, as does your depression. So one of the ideas I want to propose is that um, there may be a case for less being more, or this idea that um, when we have a reduction in certain ac activity in the brain, uh, that allows for what they call disinhibition of other parts. So disinhibition is like a double negative, but l most structures in the brain serve to inhibit other structures. Uh, you can't have your brain all lighting up in one go. That would just be chaos. Um, and when 
inhibiting structures uh, decrease in their functioning, uh, so other structures are disinhibited. And one of the ideas that this relates to is what, what the uh, machine learning people call the exploration-exploitation trade-off. There seems to be an inherent trade-off in biological evolution as well as uh, in the machine learning literature that seems uh, hard to get around. You can't create a comp uh, an AI that, does, that maximizes exploration while maximizing exploitation. Another way of referring to it is a learning performance trade-off. We're either being broad and flexible and picking up on all kinds of task negative information, things that are not in our direct, uh, the direct confines of our goals, or we're being exploitative or performing efficiently and, and, and uh, rapidly, and then we have very narrow goals and we don't pick up on all kinds of divergent information. And so it makes sense that if you've got this trade-off, there'll be a sweet spot, and maybe it is the case that um, we need to oscillate along that sweet spot. We need to move around. And so there is, uh, I'll go back so we, I don't compete with my own slide. Um, there is a fair bit of literature that shows that positive affect, positive emotionality is associated with broadening your attentional and cognitive capabilities. And so it seems that you know, when, we're, uh, when we're needing to be uh, motivationally oriented, when we need to focus in on something, uh, we become more narrow and more rigid and we follow rule-governed behavior. And when, we're, uh, when times are not tough, when things are relatively going, going well in our environment, then we, can, then we feel positive and that can uh, allow us to broaden, our, uh, broaden and build our thought-action repertoires. Um, so we have this ability to, to move across this you know, exploration-exploitation axis. Um, and it seems that there might be a developmental aspect to this as well. Um, so reduced activity in the default mode network and, these, and certain frontal areas, which occurs in children. Children uh, have very underdeveloped uh, default mode network and frontal structures. Um, then, um, well, children are, are obviously better at all kinds of learning. They're learning machines, uh, and actually modern machine learning is... is a lot of it is being based on what happens in a child's brain. Um, they're better at core aspects of learning like language acquisition, alternative uses tasks uh, where you're measured on your ability to come up with uh, you know, unusual or original uh, uses for objects. Um, and they're better at task irrelevant memory. So if an adult and a child are, are asked to pay attention to something in particular and then given a surprise memory task afterwards, children are, seem to have a, a broader information sweep. They remember things that were not relevant to the task, which is obviously good for certain kinds of learning and certain kinds of flexibility. Um, these are just a, a, a snatch of a few different examples. They, uh, there, there are many, many more than this. Um, there's this fascinating uh, story about a kind of a degenerative brain disease that leads to what they call primary progressive aphasia, a loss of the ability to speak and, and comprehend language eventually. Um, and people that have primary progressive aphasia have remarkable enhancement in their creative expression, like very noticeable uh, in how productive they are and in how creative they are as well. So this is another example of how uh, language and frontal structures may, as they go down, in this case as they become degenerated, uh, other structures become disinhibited, they light up. <coughs> and also if you take an adult and you uh, stimulate them with something like transcranial direct current stimulation to inhibit neural functioning in um, frontal structures, you get increases in alternative uses and in task irrelevant memory. So you can induce the childlike um, state to, to, to some minor degree in an adult. Uh, and there are obvious advantages uh, to this reduction in frontal functioning. So, you know, there's a lot more that can be said about when less is more. But, you know, this is, this is another way to look at it. <clears throat> so, I want to just take a couple of examples that look uh, at this notion of, of a hypothetical continuum that differentiates non-ordinary states from depression, which may inform um, 
an understanding of the mechanisms, the antidepressant mechanisms of these non-ordinary states. So, with regards to the self and other, if you recall, in the default mode network, one of the primary features or functions of the default mode network is to represent yourself and self-relevance. And if you look at the literature, there's a, an enormous amount of converging evidence that shows that non-ordinary states, and this spans many types of non-ordinary states, psychedelic, mindfulness, hypnotic, uh, runner's high, etc., um, are associated with a, a reduction in self-salience, a reduction in the importance of myself in, phenomenologically. Um, there are also social norm processing deficits, so difficulties in, in, in processing social norms, and if anxiety is low, then um, a reduction in social norm salience as well, so it's unimportant. Um, there's a relational inclusiveness, so the, the feeling of um, being connected to one another or connected to other things that we might have previously considered inanimate. Um, and there's this enhanced experiential saliency. So I am no longer so salient, but what is happening now in my moment-to-moment -moment experience uh, that is often externally oriented is very salient. And so uh, another way to talk about that is that uh, my experience is meaningful. It feels very meaningful in, in a non-ordinary state. If you contrast that with depression, it looks entirely antithetical. There's an excessive self-salience. Uh, the, the self is, is uh, the self-worth self along with social expectations are the primary contents of depressive rumination. Um, it involves social vigilance and uh, paying attention to social cues and rule-governed behavior around social cues. Uh, it involves experience of relational isolation. I am alone. I, I do not feel connected to others or any other objects or anything else. Um, and it involves a reduction in experiential salience. My moment-to-moment -moment experience is meaningless. And in, in a sense, this meaninglessness is um, p potentially a, the primary driver of helplessness and hopelessness, which are the primary predictors of suicide. So, taking this example of self-reference, just to uh, look at the brain in a little bit of more detail, the structures most relevant to self-representation are the medial prefrontal cortex and anterior parts of the singular cortex. Um, and these structures are the most consistently hyperactive structures in depression. Uh, they have greater activity and greater uh, functional connectivity between them in depression. Um, medial prefrontal cortex reactivity to negative information, that is, you know, you get shown a disgusting picture and parts of your brain respond to that disgusting picture. If you have a medial prefrontal cortex that reacts more strongly to negative information, um, it predicts rumination, which is the primary cognitive process in depression. Um, and if you have your, your sensory cortices light up more in response to some negative information, then that predicts uh, less rumination uh, and less relapse into depression. And a range of uh, antidepressant methods from pharmacotherapy to vagus nerve, deep brain and cognitive behavioral therapy interventions, if they're effective, that is, their effectiveness is correlated with normalizing this hyperactivity in these uh, default mode network structures. If we now look in contrast to that, this is a, a study I think we're all familiar with. This is the, um, the Tom Cruise study of the, of the year. Uh, the most consistent neural correlate of psilocybin is a decrease in these very structures. Uh, and the magnitude of the decrease in these structures is predictive of the intensity of the phenomenological experience. Uh, there were a whole bunch of news articles that came out after this Card-Harris finding and um, that, uh, that seemed to say that people were surprised about a reduction in activity associated with psilocybin. I, I think a lot of people were not surprised at all. Um, and this 
reduction is also associated with a subjective loss of ego. Psilocybin is in, gen in general associated with a subjective loss of ego. Um, I realize I'm going to have to go a bit faster than I'm going, so let me try that. So another, another feature that you could look at to contrast altered states and depression is this idea of making sense of reality. Um, there's a large burgeoning field called predictive processing, which fundamentally views the brain as a prediction machine whose primary role is the reduction of prediction error. Uh, this is an incredibly adaptive um, uh, function and the predictive processing model uh, uh, seems to be receiving a lot of support empirically now as well. So, um, on the non-ordinary side of the spectrum, again across a range of non-ordinary states, you see that there is this uh, greater influence from exogenous or external and novel information. Uh, another way of saying that is that there is uh, a weighting towards prediction error. So, although there's not much time to go into it, the basic um, prediction processing idea is that we have predictions and then we have prediction errors and they uh, are in a kind of reciprocal loop. And we differentially weight our predictions and our prediction errors uh, depending on how sure we feel about our predictions or, or how sure we feel about the circumstances around which we see, re receive an error. And non-ordinary states seem to be involved in an increased weighting in, in prediction error. That is, we, we notice what, what we previously would have called noise. Noise becomes signal and, and we notice it. Um, prediction error weightings associated with flexible thinking and another way of saying that is contingency sensitivity. So this uh, ability to be sensitive about the changing contingencies of, of the environment. There's a perceptual em emphasis, so this is again exogenous. Um, Hypersuggestibility is associated with non-ordinary states as it is associated with uh, infancy and childhood. Uh, a simple external suggestion is, is um, followed much more readily in a non-ordinary state than not. Uh, and this idea of particularization, that is that every object or everything or every moment becomes more particular, less generalized. So in the past where you might have just seen the category tree, now for the first time you notice that tree uh, as if seeing it for the first time. On the other end of the spectrum, depression is associated with uh, endogenous influences, more, a greater influence from internal um, uh, thoughts and uh, interoception and familiar information and you could consider that to be like prediction weighting. So we weight our predictions more than we weight the errors that come from the environment. Uh, it's associated with rigid cognition, uh, with non-contingency, which I'll explain in a bit more detail soon, with abstraction. Um, this is a, a central feature of depression, persistent biased beliefs. So th this uh, insensitivity to contradictory information and overgeneralization. Um, in terms of non-ordinary states, uh, this is also quite well known that mindfulness training increases flexible cognition for changing contingencies. When the environment switches on you or when uh, there's a, a rule that you've learned that now you have to unlearn to learn a new rule, mindfulness helps you at that. Um, psychedelics increase flexible con cognition in a range of ways. They increase creative thinking and insight, divergency, etc. Um, and mindfulness and psychedelics increase uh, phenomenological experience of contact with the here and now. Excuse me for the speed. Um, so, one of the structures that is uh, really central to monitoring um, the discrepancy between goal states and the current events or the prediction errors um, is dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Wow, this went by fast, didn't it? Um, and depression is linked to deficits in specificity and function of the, the default, of the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so this just leads into a little empirical study that I want to tell you about. Depression, cognitive rigidities are a central feature of depression. In, in many models of depression, they are a primary diathesis or risk factor for depression. Um, in addition, perseverative cognition and perseverative emotionality and physiological responding are central symptoms. Um, as I mentioned, depression is associated with these persistent biased beliefs that are insensitive to contradictory information. And there's this idea of learned helplessness. That is, 
uh, I cannot affect the world either. So there's a reduction in the ability to notice changes in the world and to be able to, uh, to feel like you can affect the world. But this question of insensitivity to changing contingencies has got mixed findings. And I was in part addressing uh, this question in, in one, of my, one of my PhD studies. Um, there are basic uh, tasks that measure contingency changes. The Wisconsin card sort task is, is a popular one. It has uh, symbols on cards, and you learn a rule about the symbols, and then the, the rule changes on you, and you have to learn a new rule. And I argue that these lower perceptual features are quite irrelevant to depressive rumination. Uh, so there's this idea that, that depressive rigidity is, is central, but there are, I think, boundaries to depressive rigidity. I don't think it necessarily applies to all forms of cognition. Um, so, as I say, the Wisconsin card sort test shows uh, mixed findings, though depressives tend to be more rigid in the Wisconsin card sort test, involving these lower order perceptual features. Uh, if you have emotional versions of this, then they're much more rigid. And there's this idea of depressive realism that uh, has been mostly debunked that uh, depressives seem to be better at assessing how good they are at controlling the outside world. Actually, they seem to just have a reduction in, in uh, optimism. Um, and so I argue that the domain of depressive rigidity is about rumination. That's the central cognitive feature, which is inferential. It's about higher order sense making that is to do with social expectations and self-worth content, and it occurs in a narrative form. And so, I'm going to run you through this really quickly. Um, I developed a task called the Narrative Expectancy Violation Task, um, which is an, a task that tests whether depressive symptoms are linked to deficits in processing expectancy violations for rumination-relevant information. That is, you have a prediction about something, can you now take in exogenous uh, information to alter your predictions? The task probes this balance between prediction and prediction error or weighting at a level that's relevant to depressive thinking and it could highlight some potential mechanisms for the persistence of these very core biased beliefs. Um, this is how the task went. They were short orally delivered vignettes. They were ambiguous but they imply an initial interpretation and then there's a subtle expectancy violation that's only compatible with some concealed interpretation. And you're scored on, uh, there's some questions afterwards and you're scored on your ability to change interpretations. I'll give you a quick example, see if you can uh, listen. Before Wendy and Joan have even taken their seats at the cafe, a man at the next table leans in and tries to strike up a conversation. It's only mid-morning, but the man's breath stinks, his words are slurred, and his eyes seem unfocused. What are you two pretty ladies up to today? He asks. Wendy and Joan have not seen each other in months and try politely to turn away from the man, but he interjects again. He can barely string a sentence together and he spits when he talks. Wendy is now feeling uncomfortable. Joan is smiling, somewhat amused. They try to ignore him. Someone returns from the cashier and wheels the man out and Wendy and Joan exchange relieved glances with the waitstaff. They order their skinny lattes and feel strangely invigorated from the event. Okay, so the, the questions will come after that and the target question is why is the man slurring his words? So you obviously were primed because you know what these stories are about, but this was a particularly subtle one, it's quite hard. Only about 10% of people got it, so you're not depressed if you didn't get it. Uh, anyone would like to offer their uh, drunk? Yep. Yep. Why did you think that? Exactly. So there's an expectancy violation word. It's quite subtle. Somebody wheels the man out. He's, he's in a wheelchair. Ah, you, you might not be drunk, yeah? Um, so that's quite a subtle one. There were 20 of these, and um, I measured your ability to, to switch. And I will, I will go through this super quickly. I used Mechanical Turk, 168 participants in the United States, a whole bunch of confounding, potential confounding measures there. Ding, ding. And... Um, <laughs> And I found basically that depression was associated with difficulties in switching, regardless of whether the switch went to a more positive or a more negative interpretation. So it's not a negativity bias, it's a rigidity mechanism. And it potentially highlights a basic cognitive mechanism that could explain the persistence of biased beliefs in depression. But it also shows that they're wa relatively weighting their predictions over their prediction errors. That's another way of showing it. I'll skip through this data, even though I wanted to show you some data. Uh, maybe this is uh, better for another conference. Um, and just finish up by showing you that um, 
this basic idea that there's this kind of hyperordinary depression idea that is developing, in my mind at least, um, where these basic features that, ha that are quite common to non-ordinary states may inform uh, our understanding of what's happening in depression and our therapeutic interventions for depression. So this idea of reduced self-salience, perceived connectedness, flexible cognition, exogenous and novel influence on your, on your cognition, uh, perceptual concrete cognition, meaningful cognition, uh, as compared to what you see in the depressed state, which is antithetical to that. Um, and so, just to finish up, last slide, um, this is a kind of, a, an idea that, that maybe there's this adaptive hypothetical continuum, this adaptive way in which we can move up or down on the spectrum, and maybe depression involves moving uh, in a maladaptive way too far up, uh, up the ordinary spectrum to, into hyper-ordinary zone, um, which involves uh, all kinds of maladaptive outcomes that are uh, associated with depression. Thank you very much.